All right, I have the um, privilege of uh, introducing um, my friend Andrew Emmerich to join us next on the stage. Andrew's a partner um, at Holland and Hart in Denver, Colorado, and he represents clients um, in significant litigation and permitting efforts in the areas of oil and gas, mining, and renewable energy projects. He has more than 20 years of experience in energy, environmental, and natural resources lit litigation on um, let's see, and, and federal and state uh, agency administrative appeals. On the permitting side, Andrew advances his clients' projects through focused strategies to obtain expeditious and defensible permitting and regulatory approvals for projects on and across federal, state, and tribal lands. Um, Andrew began his legal career in Washington, D.C. as a legislative counsel for the former U.S. Senator Michael Enzi. He's a Casper native, and my favorite part is he's a graduate of the University of Wyoming College of Law. So Andrew, with that, I'll turn the stage over to you. Thank you very much, Temple. It's a uh, real delight to be back in Laramie at the annual landscape discussion on energy and policy law for the Rockies. I was sort of amazed to hear earlier, this is actually the ninth year. I think I was at either the first or the second year, so it's hard to believe it's nine. And really kudos to you, Temple, Holly, Dean Alexander, and your team for putting together what I really consider to be one of the preeminent conferences on energy law and policy anywhere in the Rockies, quite frankly. So thank you for that. Uh, as always, you put together an excellent presentation, uh, present company excluded. Um, you know, one of the things, you know, there was a little bit of discussion earlier about technology and innovation, and that has been on display throughout today's discussion, Phil Lowe's uh, discussion on cryptocurrency, although I only really understood about 15% of what he said, uh, was, was very much a part of that. But the other thing I noticed is that T Temple and her team, and I don't know if this was you or Emily, um, I have noticed innovation in the name tags. I can guarantee uh, when we started this nine years ago, these things were not as large. The, the name tags are now approximating the size of Rhode Island, and I think they have their own gravitational pull. But what's really cool about them is they're perfectly designed for Laramie. I had to go over and check out of my hotel earlier, and one of those Laramie gusts hit me. And of course, this thing goes flipping around. And I thought, well, that's cool. It came up, and my name is still going forward. Well, it turns out it's on both sides. So, you know, talk about technology and innovation. We're gonna talk a little bit about today uh, about carbon capture utilization and storage law and policy. There's a lot to be said here. Um, this could easily consume a full semester law school course in terms of the complexities of all the different issues, but we're gonna to try to give a relatively high level uh, presentation while taking a little bit of a granular uh, uh, approach on a couple of the issues. So for those who maybe have not paid attention or maybe this is not part of your practice, uh, what is CCUS? We use a lot of acronyms in the environmental law world, so of course we have to have an acronym for this. Uh, carbon capture is basically the, the, post, the pre or post combustion capture of CO2 from air emissions from a stationary source. It can be done from, uh, can be done from utility, it could be done from an ethanol plant, but essentially you're trying to capture CO2 before it goes into the atmosphere and then deal with it. Utilization is the industrial commercial use and storage, which is mainly what we're gonna discuss today uh, really has sort of two components. There's geologic sequestration, which is sort of the long-term storage uh, of CO2 to deal with sort of climate change goals, and then enhanced oil recovery, which of course CO2 has been used for, for many decades uh, on that front. I'm just gonna flag a few of the key legal issues. I know we have some law students here and some practicing attorneys as well. So this falls into the sort of the issue spotting uh, part of the presentation. This list could be much longer, but I'm gonna to try to sort of identify what I consider to be some of the key issues and then see how these are, are being addressed by the state and by the BLM uh, as, as they try to put together kind of a workable regulatory program. So what are some of the state statutory and common law issues? Uh, one of the issues that may surprise you, but has not been settled universally, is who owns the forest space. What we're talking about is subterranean space where we're going to store CO2, and there is, uh, it's settled in some states, but not all, whether that is owned by the surface owner, or whether that's owned by the mineral owner, or whether that's been severed at some point during the title and transferred to someone else. Um, 
the ability to unitize poor space. That's become a big issue. Wyoming, I think, is, is sort of on the forefront of trying to deal with that issue. North Dakota as well. That's not an issue that's been dealt with by all the states. What's the long-term uh, liability of the injector? Once we put this stuff underground, it's really designed to stay there perhaps for centuries. What happens after a certain period of time? Does the person that put, the, the entity that put the CO2 underground, do they bear the long-term liability indefinitely? And if so, does that become a barrier to sort of commercial uh, sequestration projects? And then what's the impact on some of the other land uses? Um, one of the things I know that the Bureau of Land Management has, has been sort of struggling with is how, given that there could be a potential overlap with the mineral estate, how do we sort of ensure that the mineral estate and those rights are protected at the same time that we're allowing the surface owner to sort of get valuable uh, use from the pore space? Now, what are some of the federal land use issues? Uh, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, but which regulatory and statutory regime? I think one of the things that uh, Deputy Secretary Boudreaux mentioned this morning is that you know most of our major environmental statutes were passed in the early 70s. So we're really looking at about 50 years on with some of these statutes, and now we're applying them to new uses that really were not envisioned 50 years ago. Um, what is the term of use and what is the fee for the injection? Can federal lands be unitized with non-federal lands through sort of state, uh, in the case of Wyoming, Oil and Gas Conservation Commission program? And what is the scope of the environmental review? These are just some of the issues that I know uh, BLM is wrestling with. And then on the regulations where the injection side of things, who is the regulator? Is it gonna be the EPA? Is it gonna be the state? What are gonna be the terms of that? What are the permit requirements? And what ultimately is sort of the scope of the Safe Drinking Water Act Authority, which ultimately is sort of the statutory basis that allows uh, a regulator like the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality to issue permits for CO2. There are a lot of incentives out there right now, people who've sort of followed things in the press, and there's been a fair amount of discussion today about the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, but there are a lot of uh, incentives on the economic side. There are policy incentives, especially coming from the, from the uh, very highest levels of the Biden administration to encourage uh, carbon sequestration. And I've got this third bucket that we're gonna talk about briefly. It's what I would sort of consider soft policy initiatives. There's sort of the environmental benefit, uh, to be sure, uh, for CCUS, but they're also what I consider some sort of operational or pragmatic benefits that are, are going to be uh, sort of borne out over the next, uh, the next several years. Um, all right, so what has this administration said about uh, CCUS? Uh, and by the way, CCUS is really on the policy level is not new. Uh, those that were kind of following these issues during the Obama administration know that there were a series of sort of uh, intergovernmental reports that were issued and policy statements trying to encourage uh, CO2 sequestration, but they really didn't get very far. It just that, that I, whether it was the, uh, the, the commercial side of it wasn't quite ready or the law and policy sort of had not caught up with that yet. But what we see, uh, this was a report that was issued earlier this year by the Council of Environmental Quality. And for those who know, that's sort of a, a, an office within the White House. Their primary job was to sort of promulgate uh, regulations for the National Environmental Policy Act. So they handle the NEPA regulations. They also end up being sort of a coordinating office within the executive office that sort of gets the different agencies to talk together. But this is what they said in their report uh, of February of this year. Uh, and I'm just going to read this because I think it sort of, in a way, kind of sets the standard for what this administration would like to do with CCUS. To reach the president's ambitious climate goal of net zero emissions economy-wide by 2050, the United States will likely have to capture, transport, and permanently sequester significant quantities of carbon dioxide. So this is coming from the highest levels of the White House. There's a clear directive that if we want to come anywhere close to the net zero goal of 2050, carbon sequestration and storage is gonna be a huge part of that. All right, what are some of the financial incentives? I'm not gonna go into these uh, in depth, but just to sort of get them out there for people who are wondering, there is a remarkable uh, economic incentive now on the financial side that has just been increased under the Inflation Reduction Act, and that's the 45Q tax credit. There are different credits depending if you use permanent sequestration or whether the CO2 is used for EOR, but this is a big economic driver. And I think what we're gonna see is more and more companies Companies getting into this space in large measure to, to sort of take advantage of these financial incentives. California has its own program. Uh, we're not going to go into that in detail today because it's extraordinary compl 
extraordinarily complex, number one. Number two, it's unclear uh, what projects could actually qualify, but it is a driver out there and it's being talked about by, by those that are interested in, in uh, carbon sequestration. And there's a whole slew of, of financial incentives now in terms of grants and other monetary incentives from a variety of federal agencies. All right, this is the one that sort of falls into that third category that I'm going to spend a minute on because I think it's something that uh, the agencies are probably at the very early stages of unpacking. Those that have followed uh, sort of NEPA related litigation in particular, especially related to oil and gas uh, extraction and leasing, and most of those challenges, uh, you have those that I consider the traditional ones that are based on sort of sage grouse and sort of traditional on the ground impacts. Most of the litigation we now see in the NEPA space, though, has to do with whether the agency, uh, typically BLM, properly quantified and analyzed the impact of greenhouse gas emissions. All right, extraordinarily complex undertaking. I wouldn't wish that on anybody, but uh, we've got an expert team here working on that. The National BLM issued uh, a report a couple years ago. Um, it was called the 2020 BLM Specialist Report. I think it actually came out in 2021. But what it tried to do is, is to sort of get some analytical framework for how to look at greenhouse gas emissions. One of the challenges that we've seen in the oil and gas leasing side is a challenge by some of the NGOs that say, look, UBLM have an obligation to sort of compare this particular lease sale, not simply with sort of emissions in the, in the immediate geographic area, you know, the project area, so to speak. We want you also to compare the emissions from this lease sale on a statewide basis, and compared to all the federal lands in the United States. So I think what BLM was trying to do, at least in part in this, is to give some analytical framework to say, how would we even think about this? And so they sort of gave a, uh, a summary of global GHG uh, emissions, and then they sort of telescoped down to national emissions, state emissions, all emissions, both direct and indirect from federal lands. And these, by the way, are primarily oil and gas and coal emissions. And then they sort of compared the fossil fuel greenhouse gas emissions uh, with what they called carbon budgets. Now, this is a little bit of an interesting term. These are not sort of hard regulatory limits on how much BLM is allowed to authorize on a state-by-state -state basis. It's designed, I think, to be more of an analytical tool. But what's interesting is this, this uh, uh, language from, from section 10.2. Because once they sort of set up the carbon budgets for every state, and again, they do it by direct emissions, which are the emissions that actually come out of the ground or from the equipment as you're you know, drilling oil and gas wells or you know, developing a coal mine. They also did it by indirect emissions, which are sort of the downstream emissions once you ship the natural gas to the utility or the coal to the, to the coal-fired utility and the emissions come out. So what, one of the things they, they noticed was if we're gonna sort of get a, a hold and actually set uh, a, a limit per state. And again, the carbon budgets were largely designed to say, look, if we're actually gonna meet the president's goals of getting to net zero, if we're gonna comply with the Paris Climate Accord goals of reducing GHG emissions, we're gonna try to set these budgets on a state-by-state -state basis. One of the thing I think that was very interesting though is you basically, have two choices. You could either say we're going to drastically reduce uh, the number of uh, direct emissions, so we're going to sort of radically scale back oil and gas leasing and coal development in a state like Wyoming. That's one way to get you to, to a relatively low carbon budget. But the other is through a mitigation strategy. How is it that we can use other creative techniques to actually reduce that? And they specifically called out in this report uh, carbon sequestration. Um, so I actually think going forward, at least on an analytical basis, and again, I'm not saying that these are hard targets that BLM has to comply with, but as they're going through their NEPA analysis for fossil fuel authorizations, I do think that one of the analytical tools they'll have in the NEPA toolkit is to look at wide commercial scale carbon sequestration as being a net positive benefit that actually allows them to do a lot of the things uh, that I think they need to do, and quite frankly, that the state of Wyoming probably wants to continue as we go forward with energy transition. All right, I'm gonna talk primarily in, on the update side about three issues. Uh, I'm gonna talk about BLM's uh, CCUS instruction memorandum uh, that came out this summer, some of the Wyoming statutory revisions that were enacted earlier this year in the last uh, legislative session, but become effective next year. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Department of Environmental Quality's regulations. Now, these are not brand new. These came out uh, about two years ago. 
but I think it's worth thinking a little bit about those, especially as they sort of tie in with some of the things that are happening on public lands. BLM issued its instruction memorandum of June 8th of this year. And for people who kind of wonder why were they doing this, I think it was in part to give a little bit of clarity uh, on the operational side when you have the administration saying we have this push toward carbon sequestration. You have uh, project applicants that are thinking about, look, we would like to do a project perhaps on federal land. What's the framework under which we even would apply for such a permit? And so the instruction memorandum, it's not law in the strict sense. It's not a regulation. Uh, and as uh, Phil Lowe mentioned earlier, uh, regulations obviously have a different stature. It's a guidance document, but I think it's a very useful one. And quite frankly, I, I sort of applaud BLM for taking this step because there, were a lot, there was a lot of uncertainty in terms of which regulatory program was gonna be used for carbon sequestration on federal lands, what kinds of issues they had to work through. And I think they at least identified and they gave a little bit of focus uh, for that project. These are some of the highlights. I think perhaps in my mind, the most significant one is identifying which statutory and regulatory provision is gonna be used for these projects. Uh, for those in the public land sphere, you probably know that the Federal Land Policy and Management Act, uh, affectionately known as FLIPMA, is the sort of one of the organic acts for the Bureau of Land Management. It sort of sets the goals and, and the tenor for all the other uses that sort of flow through uh, under the, the multiple use mandate for public lands. There are basically two separate provisions of FLIPMA that could have been used, I think, for this, uh, for this process. They were both identified in a 2010 report done by all the agencies when they came together and they were asked to sort of identify, can we do carbon sequestration on public lands under existing statutory and regulatory authority? The answer that came back is yes. And we think there's sort of two options. There was Title III of FLETMA or there was the Title V right-of-way provision. So BLM has now clarified that carbon sequestration on federal lands will take place under Title V. Some of the other questions uh, that have to be worked through in the process is if there's a split estate, they have to figure out who owns the, the core space. Now, luckily in Wyoming, there's more clarity there than some of the other states, but that's sort of a threshold legal question. Um, there's an encouragement to have long-term sequestration, so a right-of-way grant for at least 30 years to sort of provide some stability for that initial application. And they would like to see steps in any sort of right-of-way authorization to ensure that there isn't uh, undue interference with mineral estate. Uh, typically, the way these things are going to be applied, the SF-299, for those who don't know, that's the standard right away. So if you were going to apply for a road or some public use on, on uh, BLM lands, that's the application that you would fill out. That is the application that will be used for large-scale uh, carbon sequestration projects, but they're also strongly encouraging a plan of development, which provides just a little bit more sort of meat to that, uh, to that skeleton. And one of the questions that remains outstanding, but I understand BLM is, is working on is coming up with kind of a fee structure. What, how much are they gonna charge to sort of inject uh, CO2 on BLM lands? And what would be the rental fee? So that is, that is sort of a work in progress. All right, just for those, uh, and I know that uh, the Wyoming State Bar and others have given some uh, CLE credit for this. So I have to throw in some regulatory and statutory citations uh, from time to time. But I do think that FLETMA actually is, uh, is, is a very good vehicle uh, for doing this. There's sort of at least two provisions of FLETMA that strike me as having the statutory sort of wherewithal to authorize this kind of use. One is section 16, uh, uh, 1761A2, which is sort of specific to certain kinds of pipelines in storage and terminal facilities in connection, where, uh, connection therewith. The other is a much broader sort of catch-all, uh, which which is subsection seven. I think either one of those, quite frankly, are, are legal bases for what BLM wants to do. Uh, there's a definition of a right-of-way and both of these agencies, the, the good thing about using Title V is that BLM updated its right-of-way regulations in about 2007 to 2008. So in the overall sort of scope of, of uh, public lands law, those are relatively new regulations, uh, which I think are useful. The Forest Service, uh, which also, by the way, is authorized this is, FLIPMA largely applies to the BLM, but this is a provision of FLIPMA that applies to the Forest Service as well. They're authorized under Title V to grant right-of-ways as well. Um, the Forest Service has its own set of sort of special use regulations. Um, and so I think they could also authorize CO, CO2 sequestration under uh, Forest Service lands as well. Now, obviously there are a lot 
of outstanding issues. Uh, because I think it was mentioned earlier, there isn't a specific regulatory program for CO2 uh, sequestration. So there are the existing regulations under BLM's Title V program, but there are a lot of questions and issues that BLM will have to unpack as it deals with specific applications. Um, and these are some of them. One of the ones I think will be interesting is whether the Forest Service sort of follows BLM's lead and issues its own administrative guidance. The instruction memorandum that I mentioned only applies to the BLM. So the Forest Service would have to sort of do its own document if they were gonna follow that and they might have to provide uh, some context because their special use regulations have a few nuances that are different from BLM's. One of the questions is what level of NEPA review? Uh, this is a different kind of project because almost all the impacts, at least on the sequestration side, are subsurface. They're gonna be underground in the pore space. And it would be possible for a federal project where there would be no impacts on federal lands. Depending on the surface ownership pattern in a state like Wyoming, you could have all of the surface impacts on state lands or private lands and the only thing the federal lands are used for is the subsurface uh, pore space. So the questions of what level of NEPA review you have to do uh, are gonna come up. And the size of the federal acreage, I think will be a key uh, scenario. There are parts of the state where you have lots of federal acreage, other parts of the states where it's fairly limited. And under NEPA law, there's sort of a, a doctrine known as the small federal handle, which is if you have a very small federal piece in the context of a much larger project, what sort of role uh, does the federal agency play in terms of analyzing that? How far out does it have to go in analyzing the impacts? I think the coordination between uh, the land management agencies uh, in the case of BLM and the state regulators is gonna be a key piece going forward. One of the things we're gonna see when we talk about the class six regulations is most of this sort of what I would consider nitty gritty regulation is really done in this program by the state DEQ. And so the question is, how does, how does BLM sort of use that analysis in the context of its own environmental review in issuing these right-of-ways? Uh, and of course, the long-term liability for CO2 storage is already out there and, and I think is, uh, is, is really being worked through on a state-by-state -state basis. All right, uh, I, I think the governor may have mentioned this morning that Wyoming was really sort of a trendsetter uh, in this area of, of establishing sort of a, a statutory framework for for carbon uh, sequestration. Um, it about, uh, well, I guess we're about 14 years now. In 2008, they, they enacted a statute that's been amended a few times since then that really sort of set the framework uh, to allow this process to go forward. One of the, the key issues they had to sort of establish is who owns the pore space. So what the state legislature said is in Wyoming, at least from 2008 onwards, it's a surface owner. Uh, now, there could be exceptions to that, depending on how the title, uh, the deeds were set up for a particular piece of property. You could also have a situation where a surface owner maybe conveyed that right. But for the most part, uh, the surface owner owns the pore space. Um, the uh, ownership and liability, the, the, the CO2 is presumed to be owned by the injector. And the liability was also presumed to stay with the injector as opposed to the pore space owner. In a lot of these cases, the owner of the pore space could be, uh, could be somebody who owns the ranch, the surface estate, and the legislature sort of clarified they would not take on additional liability simply in virtue of leasing out their subsurface pore space. They also authorized the Oil and Gas Conservation Commission to uh, establish unitization rules, which becomes really important uh, for those in the oil and gas context, as you know, to get a project of any size, unitization is, is almost, you know, it's, it's really crucial. And the federal government is involved in unitization for, uh, for federal leases. There's a, a, a specific uh, authorization for that under the Mineral Leasing Act regulations. And so one of the things that Wyoming did early on is to try to set up a program for unitization to allow larger scale projects to go forward. And it also directed uh, the Water Quality Division to, to create its own rules, uh, basically to handle um, the injection of CO2 underground. The Wyoming legislature uh, made some, I think, significant revisions this last term and uh, clarified a couple of things. One of the key ones, I think, was this question of long-term liability. They sort of followed North Dakota in this regard. North Dakota had established that uh, Liability at a certain point in time cuts off and it ends from the injector, the person that put the CO2, the entity that put the CO2 underground, and it was assumed by the state. And Wyoming ended up following that, uh, that path as well. And so the way it works in Wyoming is at the end of the regulatory process, 
the injector has to get what's called a certificate of project completion. And that's basically sort of a confirmation from the state DEQ that you have followed all of your commitments for injection, for ongoing monitoring and sort of stabilization of, of, the, uh, of the plume, the subsurface uh, CO2 plume. And once that's done, you can get a certificate of completion that then allows you to sort of start this clock to transfer long-term liability uh, to the state of Wyoming. Um, one of the things Wyoming did do, uh, which I think is probably uh, smart from a, a fiscal standpoint, is they sort of capped their own liability. So they said, we will take on the liability, but we're going to set sort of a cap. And the cap is the amount of money that we have in the geologic sequestration special revenue account. So it's not an indefinite amount of liability that the state faces. It's going to be capped by the special revenue account, which is largely funded uh, through the permit applications and the, on the ongoing work of the CO2 injectors. But this was actually a big step, I think, for the state of Wyoming. And I think it shows yet again that Wyoming wants to be sort of on the forefront to really encourage uh, CO2 se sequestration. Um, all right, we're gonna talk uh, real quickly about the, um, the class six regulations, because I think this is, uh, um, I think this is, again, these are not brand new, but they, they, we're just now getting to the point where people are actually filing applications. And so DEQ is getting the hard work of sort of working through these, uh, a, a program that's quite complex and, and authorizing uh, CO2 uh, sequestration. For those who, who, who may know, this program was, set up under the Safe Drinking Water Act. And basically what, what Congress did in delegating the authority to the EPA, EPA created a whole series of categories under the Underground Injection Control Program. And they basically set minimum standards and said if the state regulatory agencies can come up with regulations that sort of meet the minimum standards, there is an allowance for sort of variances by, by you know, local geography, et cetera. The EPA would then approve those regulations and the effect of that is basically giving the state primacy. You've heard that term earlier, primacy. So what that means is in the state of Wyoming, it's one of two states that Wyoming actually has the primacy for issuing regulations for CO2 sequestration. Very unusual. The only other one uh, that has that right now is North Dakota. Um, and there are, there's an application, as I understand it, by the state of Louisiana that's under review by, uh, by EPA. If you were outside of Wyoming, how would this work? you would have to apply to the, the regional office of the EPA, and you would have to get the, uh, the UIC classics permit from the EPA. There's, for someone who's worked with both EPA and the state regulators, you wanna deal with the state regulators if you wanna move a project through more quickly. Uh, they have tighter timelines, there's more responsiveness, and I think that they are just more attuned with sort of the needs and, and, and the regulatory sort of nuances uh, of a state like Wyoming. Here's some of the highlights of the regulations. Um, the permits are issued for the life of the facility. Uh, so there are different sort of interim stages that take place. You have to get an authorization for construction and then an authorization for, for, for injection. But it's a single permit that basically governs the life cycle of the CO2 injection process. Each individual well needs its own permit. So if you're looking at a large project where you may need six, eight, or 10 wells, each one of those has to have its own class six permit. Um, the wells in this part may be obvious, but they have to be sited in an area with suitable geographic system. And one of the things that the regulators are really going to be focused on, because again, this permit is issued under the Safe Drinking Water Act uh, program. So what the, the regulators are really looking at is to ensure that any stored CO2 is not going to adversely impact drinking water sources. So at a very sort of high level, that's kind of their mission. And that's the lens through which I think they're going to look at these applications. So for each injection zone, the regulators have to ensure that there is sufficient aerial thickness and porosity and permeability to receive the total volume of CO2, and that the confining zones, the, 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 the zones that sort of stop the CO2 from some migrating into any possible drinking water sources um, are, are devoid of, of faults and fractures. One of the things that happens sometimes in some of these areas, you may have orphan uh, wells, they could be oil and gas wells or water wells, those could be sort of zones for CO2 to navigate into uh, a drinking water source. And so sort of the mitigation of those uh, orphan wells is one of the things that uh, will have to be done. And there have to be a post, as you might imagine, a post-injection site care and closure plan as well. 
and there has to be financial um, responsibility for all phases of the project. So there's a bonding instrument or a financial assurance instrument that essentially ensures that the, the injector is, is taking so full ownership so that these uh, there will not be uh, adverse environmental or health impacts. There is a public participation uh, process, and I think this is important um, throughout all of, at least all the permits that I'm familiar with, the major permits under DEQ, they are put out for public comment and participation. So the public has an opportunity to come in and, and identify issues. Um, there is the possibility for a hearing. And there's actually, uh, there's an acronym snafu here. It says land quality division. It's actually the water quality division. So sometimes when you live in this world of acronyms, you can, you can uh, misspeak, but this is the water quality division. There can be a hearing and it's mandatory um, in certain cases, if there's a significant amount of public interest, it's otherwise optional. And then there's gonna be a uh, sort of a timeline under which the, the administrator would finalize the permit and then issue it. So this just gives kind of an overview of how the process is gonna work in a state like Wyoming. Uh, like I said, because we're on the forefront, because we have statutory clarity on who owns the pore space, we now have statutory clarity on long-term liability. We have clear statutory direction to allow the unitization of the, uh, of the pore space. And now we have a very detailed and established uh, regulatory program. I think Wyoming uh, is uniquely suited to sort of advance large scale, commercial scale uh, carbon sequestration. So that's exciting. You know, someone who's from Wyoming and does a lot of work here in Wyoming, I think this is actually uh, really exciting stuff. And I'd just like to do a, sort of a shout out to the regulators here um, uh, on two fronts. One is to get these regulations approved, that was a lot of work. Uh, it takes a long time for the EPA to re review these. They're extraordinarily complex from a technical standpoint. So it takes a lot of very smart uh, reservoir engineers and geologists to sort of work through how, how these things are gonna work and to sort of take it on to say, we're gonna be one of the very first states to do that. Uh, that, took, that, that took courage, uh, but to pull that off and to be on, on the forefront was extraordinary. The other one, quite frankly, is BLM. Um, it is easy, I think, for a federal agency when they're getting sort of policy pressure to, to allow a new use on federal lands to sort of face paralysis. There can be the tendency, tendency to say, if we don't find something absolutely specific in our regulations, we're gonna sort of wait until either Congress provides further uh, direction or until we go through sort of a formal notice and comment rulemaking to try to answer what we think are all the hypothetical issues. In my view, BLM took the right approach here. I think what they said is we have a regulatory program that works. Um, we're gonna learn something as we go through this. So let's see how far we can get under the existing legal regime. And we will learn something through that that then might fine tune and influence what they may wanna do in the future, either with an administrative rulemaking or recommendations to Congress uh, to the extent that statutory clarity is required. So I think we're kind of in a unique nexus in Wyoming of, of having sort of a, uh, 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 both what I would call agency courage and cooperation where these projects can actually go forward. So that's what I had, uh, and I would be happy. They're not gonna run me out to take any questions if we have a few minutes. Oh, all right. Law student question, my favorite. Yeah, so I was interested um, by this, you know, issue of liability. I was wondering sort of what liability exists in the case where, you know, an injector, say, you know, displaces uh, hydrocarbons from like an adjoining mineral estate. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to what that sort of would look like. Uh, well, first of all, I'm not here to give legal opinions. So next question. <laughs> uh, I, I think that I think that remains to be seen. I mean, the, the the liability that we're talking about, I think, with the state of Wyoming, is is it, it's cutting off sort of the 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 obviously the end of that. What it doesn't speak to is what would happen if there is you know adverse interference with the mineral estate. Um, I think those are issues that are going to have to be sort of worked through um, both at the the regulatory level and quite frankly, there may be uh, common law development as well. Um, so I, I don't think I don't think there's perfect clarity on that question. Thank you. Andrew? I had oh, a question. Sorry. <laughs> so I had two questions. One is is CO2 
a leasable mineral under the Federal Mineral Leasing Act, or is it considered as waste? You talked about BLM perhaps charging fees uh, on rental. Uh, since it's going under the purview of FLIPMA, you know, I, I thought that CO2 was a leasable mineral. So I just was confused about that. And then the second question was, what's the social acceptance or who's been working social acceptance in Wyoming for carbon sequestration? Uh, where does where do the kind of non-technical citizens of Wyoming stand on their knowledge and comfort with uh, carbon sequestration? Yeah, no, I, I think those are both excellent questions, Rebecca. I think on the first question, uh, th th this was actually an interesting question, whether CO2 sort of storage is something that would be done under the Mineral Leasing Act or whether it would be done uh, under FLIPMA. Now, because by and large the law is, and in some states it's defined by statute, but even under common law, the majority view is its owned by the surface of the state. So uh, BLM's authority, it's looking to its surface authorities as opposed to its Mineral Leasing Act authorities. It's different than gas storage in that regard. Um, and so it is a different regulatory program. It's not done under the Mineral Leasing Act. The other thing about the Mineral Leasing Act is largely established to sort of provide a, you know, you're taking out something out of the ground, um, but you're getting economic benefit for that. So whether you're taking out, you know, oil, natural gas, coal, or whatever, someone is selling that. And so there's an economic benefit to the person doing the extraction. And it makes sense to then have a, a rental and royalty going to the federal government. CO2 is really different. I mean, in one sense, it's a waste material. And so it's being stored underground for other benefits, but it's not, once it's under there, the economic benefit is not because it's it's producing further sort of benefit. Now, there could be these other, what I mentioned, the economic incentives, but nobody is going there and saying, oh, by the way, I will pay you X amount for the, for the stored CO2. That's not the way it works. So I think BLM wisely looked and said, because it, 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 the core space attaches to the surface estate, we're going to look under our FLIPMA uh, authorities rather than our Mineral Leasing Act. Um, now, the second question, I think, is a better question for public affairs person uh, than, than a lawyer in terms of who is doing um, you know, sort of the social acceptance work. I think that's probably largely being done by, uh, by the companies. Um, the companies that are looking at this, I know, are sort of starting that dialogue at least. It's done in the context of individual uh, negotiations with landowners as you have companies going out trying to secure the core space. Is there a broad-based so, sort of coordinated effort? I suspect that's still in its earlier stages. Oh. Hey. Yes. Thanks, Andrew. That was a great presentation. Um, my question is more on the, so the cap on liability, it's great that the state's taking on liability after this, the 20 years, but does that mean that an entity can't then dissolve or has to have plans for dissolution that anticipate anything beyond that? Because obviously if it's capped, then somebody's going to be on the hook for anything beyond that. Um, and then the second part, does that mean that the bond isn't released at that point? So uh, I'm sorry, tell me the first, the, the second one is, is the bond released? The bond could be released once the state okay. assumes liability. So because once you get the certificate of completion, that sort of puts in motion this process to sort of transfer over the liability and the, uh, the company could, could remove the bond. But yeah, the first, the, first part was, the first part was more along the lines of planning. And so if the state's liability is capped, ultimately somebody's responsible if there are damages above and beyond that cap. And so I assume that that's the entity that was operating or owning the facility. And so at that point, does that mean that, you know, I'm sure these are you know, set up as entities for the duration of 50 years or whatever. So at the end of that 50 years, does that mean that that entity has to plan to be on the hook for that liability in the future, if there's anything above and beyond that cap? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I think that I, I, I and again, that's a very good question. I don't know exactly if it, would, if it would sort of have to be an increment. I think that once the state assumes liability, though, the injector is off the hook. That's my understanding of, of how that would work. Okay. Um, and again, I think it's, you know, it's interesting. We're talking about liability here. I don't think there is the view that this is, a, is you know, the CO2 is, is sort of a dangerous thing. We're not talking about, um, you know, a hazardous material or something like that. We're basically talking about, you know, something that has a particular problem with regard to global climate change and, and uh, GHG emissions. But I think that the view is that it will actually be very safe uh, to store it underground. So I think the, the long-term liability, it, it, you do, anytime you're starting a new program, you want, to be, you want to be careful. There's no doubt about that. I don't think there is the anticipation, though, of, of extraordinary damage to whether it's the drinking water or other subsurface uses. 
Yeah, I, I mean, I was just thinking if, if it's released and it's 50 years from now, who knows what the regulatory scheme is at that point and how, you know, from a climate change perspective, how damaging that could be or how damaging that could be seen. And so, you know, damages assessed now could be, you know, orders of magnitude more 50 years from now. Yeah, you know, the sort of scoring out or anticipating the long-term liability of something is, is always a tricky endeavor, right? I, I remember there was a lawsuit when I was at the Justice Department that it that involved the, the plan to do sort of long-term storage of spent nuclear waste in Yucca Mountain in Montana. And those who, excuse me, in, in Nevada. Those who have sort of followed energy for a long time know that there was this, this Congress actually set this up. The, the goal was to sort of encourage nuclear generation. We have to have a place to put the uh, nuclear waste. It was currently at that point being stored all over the country. So they were going to store it in a permanent facility in Yucca Mountain. Uh, now, the legal challenge, as you can imagine, from the environmental groups and, and uh, folks within Nevada were, were, were very complex. But one of the questions that came up, and this was really fascinating because I went to the argument in the DC circuit, was whether they had properly analyzed the potential impact of spent fuel waste for 10,000 years. Um, so whether the Nuclear Regulatory Committee, uh, Commission had done an adequate sort of NEEP analysis going out 10,000 years. So when we're talking about 50 or 100 years, in the overall scheme of regulatory uh, certainty, I think we're at least within the realm of what is, what is conceivable as opposed to 10,000 years. Uh, thanks, Andrew. I'm gonna bring us back to about 10 years. Um, the question of CCUS, you talk a lot about the S, what about the U? In terms of the, the legal framework, you said Wyoming is a leader in that for the sequestration. How does that impact our ability to utilize it as um, an economic force in the state? So the uh, two things on that, if what you're talking about is the enhanced oil recovery, it's actually handled by a different sort of regulatory program. It's the class two program uh, as opposed to the class six. In Wyoming, again, we also have primacy for that program that's handled by the Wyoming Oil and Gas Conservation Commission. So that's actually for EOR uh, process. If that's at least part of your question, that would be done by the Oil and Gas Commission as opposed to DEQ. Was there, was your question broader than that about sort of how, what it, what the, you know, I'm not gonna go into all of those. I think there are probably people here that are better situated than I am, but I think what, what ends up happening is by allowing Wyoming to sort of be a location for sequestration, you open up all sorts of very creative business opportunities that will be inclined to be cited in Wyoming. Um, everything from the creation of hydrogen to you know, new sort of creative uh, power plants um, that could be located very close to, we heard, we heard earlier today a power plant that having sequestration that's located sort of a mine mouth uh, for, for a power plant. So there's all sorts of creative opportunities that open up on, on the financial side of this as well. Hey, Andrew, I just wanted to get back to Rebecca's question. So carbon dioxide would be a leasable mineral within the um, fluid minerals leasing, but once it has been removed from that system, it's no longer a deposit subject to leasing under the Mineral Leasing Act. And the analog is uh, waste mine methane. So methane is a leasable mineral, but when it has been released into um, the ventilation air system of a mine and subsequently captured, it's no longer subject to leasing under the Mineral Leasing Act. And there's an IBLA case from about 10, 12 years ago that laid out that proposition. So I think, yeah, you could, once it's, once it's been captured and now we want to put it back, it doesn't change back magically to be leasable once we've, once we've done that. And the decision, the IBLA decisions was vessels, coal, gas. Um, it, it is great to have the government experts here uh, to answer those questions. So thank you, Phil. Great. Thank All right. You well, thank much. you, Andrew.